The three dissenting Supreme Court justices did issue a blistering dissent today. It was penned by Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Let's discuss all of that with former Deputy Assistant Attorney General Tom Dupree. Tom, always great to see you. What do you make of the dissent? Earlier, Jan Crawford told us it was significant. What about legally? What does it all mean for presidential powers going ahead? Right. I think the dissent is significant. Look, Justice Sotomayor, I thought, wrote very powerfully and very passionately about the dangers that she thought the majority's opinion would unleash. She made the point, which is true, which is a hallowed principle in American law that no one is above the law. And at least in her view, the majority's decision basically overturned that presumption. In some respects, it actually reminded me of Justice Breyer's dissent back in Bush versus Gore, where he expressed great personal concern that the majority's decision would undermine people's faith in judges as neutral arbiters of the rule of law. Hopefully, Justice Sotomayor's dire predictions of the consequences of today's ruling won't come to pass. But there's no question that she felt very, very strongly that the majority had made a significant turn in the wrong direction. Earlier in the show, we talked with Scott McFarlane about where, what this all means for the January 6th case and whether it will take place this year, whether Judge Tanya Chutkin will try to speed things up, even though she has to now deal with a lot of these presidential power questions. What's your assessment about how Jack Smith, the special counsel, is going to handle this and move ahead? I think there are going to be two consequences, uh, both on Jack Smith's plate. The first is he is going to have to narrow his complaint. There's no question that at least some of the conduct that he charged Trump with has now been declared to be immune from prosecution by the Supreme Court. So he is going to have to dust off his complaint, march through his allegations one by one, and make a determination as to which ones he thinks survive and which ones don't. The second way it's going to affect what he does is, to your point, timing. No question in my mind that the homework assignment that the Supreme Court gave Judge Chutkin to figure out how to apply their decision to the facts of this case is going to take her months, not weeks, months to resolve. There may be other appeals arising from it. So I think the practical consequence of today's decision is it makes the possibility of a trial before the November election zero. As a lawyer, what's the definition of an official act based on your reading of this ruling? If former President Trump, to steal one of his phrases, goes out on Fifth Avenue and shoots someone if he's president of the United States, but says before he pulls the trigger, this is an official act, would that pass muster in court? What defines an official act versus something that could be open to prosecution down the line based on what you've read here today? Well, that's an excellent question. And there may be a comes a point in time where that particular question has been litigated, how you figure out what's an official act and what isn't. I think in this case, and probably in any future case, it's not going to be the president's mere say-so. So to your hypothetical, if someone says this is an official act and shoots someone, I don't think that the mere saying this is an official act would do it. I think what they would look at is whether the president was making at least a colorable or a plausible argument that whatever action he took was authorized by our statutes, by our constitution. It wasn't just some sort of manufactured pretense, but it was a legitimate exercise of his presidential power under our constitution. Tom, we're going to be having to talk to lawyers like you for a long time as this all unfolds. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. For more on this and the political fallout, I'm joined now by Shelby Talcott and Bracton Brooker. Shelby is a politics reporter for Semaphore. Bracton is Politico's national political correspondent. Great to see all of you, uh, both of you here. Let's begin. I want to play some Democrats talking about the debate fallout. Let's listen. Well, I think both candidates struggled. I don't think either candidate had a uh, had a very good night on on the debate night. Uh, but I also do know that it does matter when we're looking at presidential performance and not necessarily debate performance. It certainly was a setback. But, of course, I believe a setback is nothing more than a setup for a comeback. I might even say that I had a, a more difficult evening than the president did, and here I am right now having this conversation. Uh, and I really like to remind to everybody watching that right now Tr uh, Biden is one and Trump is still zero, and he's the only person that's ever beaten Trump. And I really believe that Joe Biden will do that again. So you've heard a chorus there of Democrats shrugging off the performance, mm -hmm. focusing on former President Trump. But let's play something from today, Kentucky Governor, Democrat, Andy Bashir. Well, the debate performance uh, was rough. Uh, it was a very bad night uh, for the president. Uh, but he is uh, still the candidate. 
Uh, only he can make decisions about his future candidacy. Uh, and so as long as he continues to be in the race, uh, I support him. So what's the truth based on your reporting about the Democratic Party? Bracton, let's begin with you. I think the truth is what you're hearing right now, but uh, you got to look in between the lines, right? Yes, they are supportive of uh, President Biden so long as he's staying on the ticket. If there's any wavering of, of the president, if, the, if he shows some signal that he's willing to step down, then it's, oh, baby, it's all hands on deck. Let's go after this, which is what I think you heard uh, Governor Bashir talk about. So as long as, as Biden is, is still the, the nominee, there's going to be support around him. You don't really hear many Democrats outside of someone, say, like a James Carville, who is out there saying, like, we have to move on. We cannot put this man out on the, on the, uh, on the ticket. But if it comes to, you know, right before the, the conventions uh, and, and the president saying, like, hey, I can't do this anymore, prepare for, for kind of a, a knockdown, drag out fight for who's going to emerge as the, the top of the ticket there. What are you hearing? Yeah, I completely agree with that uh, assessment. And it feels like when I talk to Democrats, they're sort of waiting for permission to be able to say, OK, yes, sure, step aside. And that permission can only come from the president. And so far, the president has made it pretty clear that people close to him that they, people close to him want him to stay in the race. And so unless there is a shift, this is all sort of, uh, you know, panic mode that we're hearing quietly from some Democrats, but from a lot of donors as well. Um, but I'm skeptical that it goes beyond that unless the president himself decides to have a change of heart and step down. And I'll say, like, if more polls come out, like what the CBS poll has, showing that people are, are really wanting to change nominees, you know, I think Democrats may have to, to reconsider. But until more polls come out, I, I think right now, as we're speaking, Biden is safe. Yet so many Biden sources and Democrats today are looking at the Trump Supreme Court ruling on immunity and saying this is someone who faces sentencing in New York on July 11th and now has almost unlimited presidential power should he win the White House again and believe that will be a galvanizing issue for Democrats, despite what happened at the debate. What are you hearing, Shelby, from the Trump campaign about how they see this Supreme Court ruling? We've seen the social media celebration, but it's not like he has no more legal challenges. It's still a rocky road. Absolutely. Well, the Trump campaign is really trying to focus on the presidential election, and their feeling is if they win the presidential election, some of these, right, might go away. Some of these might get pushed back even further. But what they've been trying to do throughout this entire election is push all of these cases back as long as possible. And what this ruling does is effectively solidify that these cases are going to be pushed back a lot. So they are viewing that even privately as a pretty big win today. And from both of you, I'll begin with you, Bracton, is... The VP search continues for Trump. We just talked with Ashley Etienne, the former top aide to one of the former top aides to mm -hmm. Vice President Harris. What are you hearing about Republicans and how they see the Trump pick? Well, look, I, I, there was there was talk right before the debate that Trump was going to reveal his his uh, pick early, but because he said such a such a good debate, given the circumstances, I think they're going to try to slow walk this and maybe wait till uh, the the, uh, the convention later on this uh, month. But look, I mean. If, if, you're, if you're playing the parlor game, it does seem like Doug Burgum has the, the leading edge right now. But, you know, Trump is unpredictable and who knows what he actually wants. But certainly there seem to be a lot of people kind of backing the, the Burgum pick. Shelby, quickly, you're reporting? Yeah, I, I'm hearing the same thing between Doug Burgum and J.D. Vance. I think there's benefits to both and different people are pushing those candidates. Uh, Don Jr. is a really big fan of J.D. Vance, so he's certainly been talking to his father about that. Um, but a lot of people are Doug Burgum fans. And ultimately, as I'm sure you have heard a million times, the decision is going to come down to Donald Trump and, and Donald Trump alone. And it's a, such a generational difference. Uh, you have Senator Vance being 39 years old, Doug Burgum in his mid-60s. Shelby Talcott and Bracton Brookler, thank you so much for coming by. We appreciate it. Always appreciate your reporting.